Calling all nerds. This is More Than Dice, the podcast where we dive deep into the realms of everything nerdy. Whether you're a nerd culture connoisseur, a tabletop titan, a miniature gaming marveler, or just someone who proudly embraces their inner geek, this is the podcast for you. And now here's your hosts, Gonzo, John, and Nerd. Oh, and uh, sometimes Mizzy. Welcome to episode 296 of More Than Nice. I'm Gonzo. I'm John. I'm Nerd. Today we're going to be talking about how to make epic RPGs, the pros and cons, and uh, things you can look out for, things you can do, things you cannot do, all that good funky stuff. But before we get to that, we got to get to the business. We want to thank Midnight Heroes for sponsoring the channel. Make sure you check them out. they got some great chibi miniatures and uh, a chibi miniature game. Um, that you'll be seeing around. Uh, should be hitting ReaperCon as his next area. We want to thank Creature Caster uh, for sponsoring us uh, with their awesome models and also uh, Judgment Eternal Champions. If you haven't checked that out and you would like a small miniature style skirmish style game, something to check out. Um, and they also recently put out 3D terrain for it, STL, so you can print your 3D terrain for the board, uh, which is good. Uh, mm -hmm. Anytime you can do 3D over cardboards, it's always better. <laughs> Um, also, make sure to check out their tribe they have on Mind Mini Factory because you'll get, uh, if you're a member, you get uh, roughly 8 to 12 miniatures a month plus a 5th edition module. And all of them all connect, so it's a big, good story to go with. Uh, we want to thank Turbo Dork for sponsoring the channel. Uh, if you like metallic paints or turbo shifting paints, make sure you check them out. They also have some cool little extra things like um, stirring sticks and their... <laughs> rubber palette so you can rubber dry palette um so you can get that stuff like that and um <clears throat> we have a lot of good stuff coming out uh we want to thank cuttlefish colors uh for sponsoring the channel if you like some good glazing and painting of the models uh, they have some pretty good stuff they have some really good um uh bright colors that i've been using lately uh some of their fluorescence and just a very wide range of spectrum i guess best way to put it of all of the colors that they have um want to thank muse on minis also for sponsoring us and letting, helping us get our channel out there and uh we hope that you enjoy whatever they bring out and all the other stuff that's on muse on minis uh we do have discount codes to a lot of these people so if you can just check our uh, twitch channel or facebook page or whatever we can give you discount codes for a lot of them um just reach out but man do we have any um, shout-outs this week? We do at least one. Uh, Dickie Betts from the Allman Brothers Band passed. Oh, oh okay. Who, uh, I mean, so I know a lot of youngins aren't going to the Allman Brothers Band, even though they've been making music since 1969. Yeah. They're, if you guys heard some of their songs, you would recognize them as classic rock hits. Uh, Dickie was considered one of the great top 100 greatest guitarists Pretty much every time that list came out, they're a very underappreciated band. I don't want to say underrated because the people who follow classic rock really know them and understand it, but they're kind of underrated by the modern generation. Uh, you know, he was great. That I made mean, the whole band's really good. If you're into classic rock and not everyone's into it, there's a classic rock's a quite a bit different, I think, than modern rock just due to the uh, the speed and tempo and and that kind of thing. But you know, he's he was one of the greats, uh, died at age 80, so he lived a, a good, solid, long life, um, and definitely one of the greats. Okay. Um, Don't know that we had anyone else, or at least not that came across, and thanks Legion Legionnaires for letting me know about that one. I'd seen it, but it hadn't really taken a spot in my brain until he brought it up. Yeah. Um, I don't think of anything else. Nerd, do you have any? No? Okay. No. Rip, rip, rip a lot of man children leaving Warhammer 40k for stupid reasons. <laughs> yeah, that uh, that, that, that uh -huh. it's, it's kind of a, a mini rant that we're gonna go on real quick, guys. Get over it. Just if, yeah. if you can't, just get over it. And if you don't like it, go somewhere else. Don't need you in the game. If you can't get over female models, that yeah. female models are gonna be in a game. Just fuck off. 
plain and simple. Or well, it's funny because it's not the only ones. Because there's a bunch of Battlefield Open Arms because they po- posted posted the third, I believe it is, third annual um, Pride anthology that they've done three years straight now. Battle story set in the Metal Universe with a sort of Pride themed, and you know, it's been apparently the the. Uh, those guys just been going off about it. I don't know what it is. Like, you don't have to read it. Yeah. It ain't gonna hurt you. It's like, oh, cool. They made a thing for them in, in this in this thing. Cool. They're not forcing it on you. Nope. You ain't gonna become gay because you read it or something. That's not how that shit works. What? At all? Yeah, I know. <laughs> Turning the frogs gay. <laughs> I mean, the bro flakes just just can't handle it though. I don't understand. Like, it's like, oh my god, someone likes something I don't like. Hey, that's cool. People liking stuff is good because that means everyone's happy. If everyone's happy, we're all having a better world. Yeah. It's getting ridiculous. You know, I, I did it on a rant on somebody earlier. I'm like, we were talking earlier on the stream, and like someone's like, 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 oh, you know what? Uh, people you say Andor's the best, but like I don't really like it. I'm like, dude, it's okay if you don't like it. You know, you know, all these nerd fandoms, all all the properties have to evolve and add stuff for different people so they can get more popular that's what they have to do that's their thing yeah you don't have to like it you don't have to participate in it like a tv show you don't have to watch it uh, a book series a right anthology you don't have to read any of it nope custodies models you don't have to fucking buy them nope. or play them if someone plays against you who cares it's just a model inside of the field it's a target yeah none of it hurts you and the fact it's... that you think it does is sad it's really sad it's like the guys that used to get really mad at me for putting googly eyes on my rat text when playing magic. <laughs> Babies did that on Twitter today. Googly eyes on her uh, paint shaker. What if you put googly eyes on? I'm like, that's great. Oh, I, I need to find my googly eyes so that I can put them on my paint shaker. It, it's a great use for them, I'll be honest. Oh, yeah. But, uh, oh, yeah. I mean, I'm going to turn it, mine into an Eldritch Horror. It's not just going to be two googly eyes. If you could find some way to get little like tentacles that would would you would you oh my god <laughs> hey cookie <laughs> but yeah well, I, mean, I know right here's the thing get the fuck I bet I it. could find those <laughs> oh I'm sure we could but I mean honestly if, if, if just don't play it go somewhere I else but nobody cares but here's the thing the stuff suddenly there are more players for you to play against more the pot the, the hobbies. Better. Is more popular. I shared something earlier where a guy put a post up, like going like, "Is gatekeeping good?" And I'm like, "The fuck?" No. Yeah, I saw that. That's so. Short answer, no. But the the, the alarming <laughs> thing is that it was pretty split. Yeah. It's that slightly was, higher on the gatekeeping is bad, but it was. Oh my god. There was still like a quarter of the people that were okay with it. Fully okay. Half. Not even like kind of okay. Yeah, like fully okay with it. Fuck. Yeah, which is ridiculous. <sighs> yes, I don't get it. So, to sum up, gatekeeping is not good. No. If if they come into your hobby and they're painting their mechs in pride colors, they're painting. A guy got the, his Space Marines who were painting pride colors in White Dwarfs. Fucking awesome. Does that affect your game at all? Nope. No. Not even a little. Nothing. If you put something down the side of me, on the side of me, on the table, you're like, oh, oh, cool models, dude, thanks. Let, you let, hated them. Even better. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't, who cares if someone hates them? Like, you're like, oh, he painted his models, took the time, he's playing the game, he's in the hobby, he's inclusive. Perfect. And he killed for that back in the fucking 80s. Oh, killed yeah. for it. Anyways. Mini rant over. Um, let's go for the, the big, the big elephant in the room. Nerd, what are you drinking tonight? Uh, liquid death sparkling lime water. Gotcha. There, there's a guy on YouTube, the Fat Electrician. He's got uh, a second channel called The Fat Files, where he talks about which whatever he wants. Liquid death is one of them. And I love his coverage of it. He's <laughs> he's great because he's like normally military history and shit, but he does like the research and all. His thing on liquid death is great. <laughs> I suggest it for everyone. I suggest him in general. He's a cool dude. John, what are you drinking tonight? Uh, I uh, have bought Malibu uh, Caribbean rum with coconut liqueur. Nice. Uh, I'm sticking with a good old I'm H2O. Uh, I have a, a sinus infection. 
on the left side of my face of all things. Again? Oh, yeah. No. Well, it actually moved up into uh, the upper part and up into my occipital lobe and into my eyeball. So, uh, I, you know, he, like, no bueno. which was funny because my doctor's like, I don't know what it is, but I see more sinus infections on the left side of people than any other thing else. Like, they didn't teach me that in medical school. <laughs> I wonder if it's the side you sleep on, if you're is. a side sleeper. Yeah. Oh, then everything no, no. to that side. You're thinking that's, that's, that makes sense. Yeah, but I, I did find it interesting that my doctor said, because uh, we started talking about painting miniatures and his RPG game, because he's like, he's doing, I guess he's got, you know, 14 or 15 year old grandkids and he's like running D&D with them and instead of making them all like races they're like rats and they don't know that they're rats and they don't know that they're rats until the story starts or whatever so it's actually we started talking and he was like you know what you and I have too much in common here's my phone number let's get together on some stuff and I'm like yes <laughs> that's awesome which I thought was pretty cool I mean we always talk about nerd stuff and everything and D and D, and he was l learning about painting miniatures, and I was like, "Well, have you heard of contrast paints or speed paints? That's a really good way to, you know, if you don't have a lot of time, but you want some decent looking miniatures for your kids, you know, for people to play, this what it is." And he's like, "Oh, what's that?" And I'm like, "I'll send you a text." <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I'm on some H two O for right now. Nothing bad. Uh, just got to take this medication and get this infection out of my face. Um, out of my face. Out of my face. There's infection out of my face. Um, but guys, we really love you. We really appreciate you. Um, we've kind of ramped up our social media presence on Instagram and Facebook, and it has shown uh, people really dig the stupid shit we post, which is hilarious. I mean, I, it, I'm just posting models because you know I want people to see what I'm doing and you know have fun, put things on there, and getting good responses. Um. And then nerd posting her her Muppet, you know, Lord of the Rings, and getting really good responses on that, which are great models. Um, yes. Super Especially awesome. Especially for free models. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing. And then, you know, John's action figure picks, uh, which are getting really good responses. People like seeing that stuff. And, I mean, we're just, you know, we do post some new stuff like, hey, this new army's coming out or what's this about, you know. And we'll, we'll, we'll share out their, their things. Uh, the last stuff was some privateer press stuff, but... Um, for the games we follow, we'll start, you know, sharing some stuff out there that are good, positive and good, fun stuff. We're not going to post like the negatives unless it's something that, you know, is detrimental that people should know about. But um, I know I'll be posting a little bit about Warcrow uh, and sharing some stuff about that because I, I have a very good uh, I'm liking the models and what I'm seeing from the game. Um, so we'll have to see. But we really, really appreciate it. Uh, it's it's fun seeing the channel grow. And seeing more people coming in, more people liking our stuff, uh, more people hanging out. So um, I'm going to dedicate this to y'all because y'all are awesome. Um, as usual, if you see something, say something. If you hear something, say something. If you can do something, do something. If you can't, find someone who will because we've got to look after each other. Cheers. 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 Um, what before is this? oh, it's kids' juice. It's kids' 21%. juice. It's only eighty-five percent. Twenty-one percent. Just eighty-five percent. Do you not see the video of the, that guy who's like going to take his first shot and it's ever clear and it doesn't oh like he puts it in his mouth. I'm like, <laughs> dude, you started at the top. Don't do that. So my roommate didn't have her glasses on earlier and sees me start to reach for what she thought was a bottle of vodka when in fact my cup of water was in front of it oh. but she couldn't see it because her her vision was blurry and she just goes no no you do not need to be drinking out of an entire handle of vodka I'm like <laughs> that sounds like the fetus talk to me <laughs> i just that's actually true i get a glass yeah i don't care how big the glass is get a glass um, before we get started on our That's topic. That's not water. <laughs> um, we're going to be like talking water. about uh, getting into and creating epic RPG games. We're not talking about one shots. We're not talking about, you know, three adventures. We're talking about if you can ever do it, you know, a year long or something that's going to be like many, 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 many months. Yeah. Um, and not even necessarily open world. Like yeah. even just something like. 
Like, sex. I had a weekly game, and it took us two and a half years just to get through, yeah. like, Rhyme of the Frost Maiden. Yeah, done that, too. And, and, yeah. and before we get started on, on creating our own, I wanted to say that there are plenty of pre-built epic RPGs out there that are oh, yeah. perfectly fine to do. Mm -hmm. um, especially with people that are super busy, don't have a lot of time, or people that just, you know, just don't want to create the whole thing. I'm going to be running... Um, Rise of the Drow for this new group, and it supposedly takes you from first to like fifteenth or sixteenth level, awesome type thing. And it's about yeah. Drow coming up and you know trying to you know take over the world. And I was like, like they do, yeah. And I mean, it, it. I've I've already started reading it, getting it ready, and everything. And it sounds great. And it's fun. Um, <laughs> Cookie, <laughs> Cookie. We will have a Rebel Moon Part Two review when it comes to review time. You just got to stick around and wait for it. John and I have both watched it. <laughs> Um, you know, uh, it is kind of related to today's topic a little bit, and then you'll see why by the end of the podcast. Yeah. Um, but there is nothing wrong with going and buying an epic, you know, pre-built RPG for you. Let someone else do the work. Yes. There's nothing wrong with that. No. Especially if it's a good one. Now, there's some of them that are like, just kind of like, meh. But there is a lot of good ones out there uh, and a lot of good stories. So there is definitely nothing wrong with doing that um because there's a lot of work which you're gonna you're gonna hear about in a little bit there is a lot of work to go into make an epic you know multi-year whatever type rpg cinematic masterpiece is what you should be saying art of michael so Better guys, than Casablanca. Rebel Moon Part Two came out. If you don't, if you don't remember our review on Rebel Moon Part Casablanca. One, uh, Rebel Moon is actually going to be a trilogy. Um, and for people that don't know, you've only seen Part One of the trilogy because the way he does it, Part One and Part Two are the first part of the trilogy. Uh, the movie Three and Four are going to be Part Two of the trilogy. And then five and six is going to be part three of the trilogy. So we've got we, uh, more to go. If we decided get... that that's, I mean, that's not a trilogy by any definition. No. We decided at lunch on Saturday, that's called a, a shitology. A shitology. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so we will be giving a review of Rebel Moon Part 2, The Scar Giver. <laughs> and uh, you'll see that, but... Before we get to that, let's make sure let's switch over. I'm going to switch over the paint cam, um, and y'all can go ahead and get started on talking about uh, building RPGs epic style. Uh, the first thing you want to do is spend some time world building, because y with a uh, an epic level campaign, they're going to be spending a lot of time in the same world you need to have like factions and depending on how you build your world out you want you want your landscape like there's all the different like basic world building stuff you're just gonna have to do it on a much larger scale and the biggest thing it, the, and the biggest reason why you do that is continuity yes. so that your player so that you have something to reference two years down the road and we, you can go back to your notes and be like, okay, oh, they're finally getting to this part of the world or this part of the story. What did I have built for that? Oh, okay. And then you can flesh that out as needed, but... Yeah. And, and I'd say you don't need to go full detail everywhere. Yeah, no. Full detail where you start, yes, and stuff is important to that. But as you get further away, you really need more of an outline of factions and all because they may not have heard of all of that. And yeah. you can do all sorts of things because if you have the outline of the factions and other things, you can start um, all sorts of uh, NPCs dropping little clues that may or may not be right. You know, uh, uh, one line from, I think it was episode one of Fallout, I'm not going to spoil anything, where yeah, the guy still, is like... still on my list. But, but the one guy just said, the Enclave's real? Like, that's great world building. Because that says so much about people don't think that faction exists, you know, and you can do a ton uh, of work with that. You know, you could do, uh, you know, one of the worlds I did was, you know, there were no dragons, you know, but there was a whole story mm -hmm. behind where there were dragons that they would eventually have gotten to had we finished that. But 
you know, you can do little things like that that, um, you know, lead somewhere else. Like Dragonlance, of course, having no dragons become is a big deal. You know, all the think about something like Dragonlance where they do all this world building, and they don't you don't hear about the stuff in faraway lands until they start getting closer and it becomes pertinent. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, because you, if you if you do too much work, you'll end up with what my old GM did is we did something and suddenly he goes, hold on for a second, and he like pulls six pages out of his notebook and throws them away. Because apparently we had bypassed six pages worth of shit. So if you have the guidelines rather than the outline rather than everything. Mm -hmm. But you definitely need to do, you need to have at least the core of a map. But remember, yeah. like, look at ancient maps and think about how they saw things, you know, ancient world. Like when they thought the world was flat, when they didn't know about America, when they thought fucking you go around that way, you come up in India essentially. You know, you think about that kind of thing when you're making a map to make it inaccurate to a point. But that's all like high level world building stuff. And we could, we could probably do a whole cast on world building, yeah. but you need to do the world building. Oh, yeah. I would love to do one on world building at some point. That's like my bread and butter. But anyway, um, as a DM, you also want to bear in mind that this is your. Pl yes, you have an overarching plot, but don't railroad your players. Allow them to explore the world that you've given them. And you need to at least uh, provide the illusion of free will. Yeah. Like, and there are certain times when you have to give them full free will. If they're like, well, we're not going to go to the bandit camp. We're going to do this thing instead. That bandit camp should go away for a bit. File those notes elsewhere if you can, or flip fast those pages. Don't rip them out and throw them away. You might use that later. Yeah. But, you know, have them be able to, to skip stuff they don't want to do. But there are fucking consequences. That's the biggest thing about Epic and long-term games, is that there are fucking consequences to action or inaction. Yeah, and you want to have notes. You want to have uh, spreadsheets of, like, at, at least in my opinion. You're probably going to end up with both, because that way you've got something to build out. Like, your factions, your almanac, like, your... <laughs> I've got, a what, picture of the crazy, I've got a picture of the crazy guy from uh, fucking It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia with, like, the board and everything connected and all. And he's just like, that is me. Yeah. That is oh, me. Yeah. You can, Very you much can do so. that, but you have to have something like that. Um, yeah. I, I am I the use... over-preparer over when it comes to DMing. So the funny thing about as long as you over-prepare in the right way, you can't really over-prepare. Yeah, like you keep I it will... vague, and then details on the fly. Yeah, but that being said, you want to have look at look at world books from old games. Like, I know we have this thing where a lot of times, like, oh, this game is done, and you know, we just sell the books. I keep some of the books because some of those world building is great. Because not only is it just you know the the details, it's how they did it. It is so much easier to come up with something when you have a guideline of how people have done it in the past. Definitely. I, I keep, if there's anything I keep a product of, it is the world, the world books. Anything else is kind of just okay. But world books is definitely ones that I constantly keep. It's, it's just, you got to know, you got to see how it is. Cause we can all veteran DMS have fucking mental blocks. We're trying to do something. Their brain's just like, Nope, nobody. Nope. And then you have that book and you open it up like, ah, there's a guideline I can use. And you can start there. Mm -hmm. One of my favorite books to use is actually, I think it's the Encyclopedia of Imaginary Places. And it's like all these magical, it's it's Encyclopedia of Magical Fictional Lands. And I love looking at that for like ideas and references and... Like you can get idea for different kinds of factions or biomes or mm -hmm. landscapes and there's nothing wrong with stealing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, steal liberally from everything. Even yes. if it's just a format. You know, you can go into some game that's not related to the game you're playing. Like I love the format of how they list MT NPCs. Use it. Steal it. Fucking hey go. Yeah. Uh, I'm a big fan of um Depending on what I have available, three by five cards is a good one, but if you can't fit enough on those, depending on the game, you can go with a bigger card. Just get a box and the cards. Hard copy's great. I'll go through hard copy sometimes and go like just sitting around chatting with the guys for a game, be like, you remember this? And I'll like throw out a card and like, oh god, I remember that fucker. You know? 
And it's a great thing to do, like, homebrew magic items or, like, if you're giving your characters, like, feats or abilities outside of normal leveling. Cards for those two. Hells, yes. They remember them. They'll keep them after the game and they'll open up someday and be like, this fucking game was so good. And that's really means you've succeeded. But yeah, so you want to do all that stuff. You want to... I've never used Obsidian, but there's one similar that I've used. I don't remember what it's called. It's been a minute. There's like an online one where you can put all the stuff online. You can upload maps and, and, and all this stuff. And you make sort of like a wiki of your game. Oh. Um, and it it was great. I, I used to have my uh, players write after game reports of what happened during that session. And just seeing the different ways they would do it was great. Um, I don't know what it was called. I'd have to find it. It is actually associated with a email account I no longer use. Mm. But, um, but yeah, so the planning is important. And more as much as important as the world planning, and I'm sure Nerd will, Nerd will agree, is the arc of what you guys yes. are going to do. Yes. And you got to have an arc. Now, and, I'm a big, just put people in the world, let them go. And you can get some epic stuff out of that, but you're putting yourself at a disadvantage to make it epic. And be sure to give, like, each character their own arc and time to shine. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah, well, that's a... Uh, that's, uh, that's just a general... What is, there's a, a DM, thing for it I DM. stole from a while ago. It's like alternating alphas or something. So each player should have a chance to be the alpha or whatever the key character at some point during the game. Now, that being said, if you see a player who's happy to fade into the background, you can let them. Because it might make your game easier. I've been in games, we did a, uh, what was it? Uh, through the Breach game, the Malifaux role-playing game. And we had a ton of players. And rather than trying to make one more hungry mouse theming for the, the spotlight, I just sat back and let myself be in the background and let the shit come to me. You yeah. know, every story's got those guys. And if you've got a player willing to do that, it's great. Yeah. I, but, I, I'm I lucky and have some a group of very strong role players that are all very invested in their characters right now. Mm-hmm. So... That is like I have I have one party that is and one party that is like we're casuals. What's up? I prefer everyone being involved, but sometimes you just get it like you know you have too many people or something. And if you if you've got people stepping back, that's take advantage yeah. of that if you need to. Yeah. I um whenever I'm I'm building an epic, I always write down. Here is step one through Z of what the story is going to be. And it's just a quick, you know, notes on there. So it's just not, you know, the bad guys are going to do the bad guy things no matter what. Yep. They're not going to pause because you decided to, you know, run off to the tavern and, you know, carouse it yeah. up for a little bit. Well, yeah, you should have you should have a timeline of when things are going to happen. A little flexible, obviously. You don't don't let everything set in stone. Correct. Yeah. Because sometimes they'll fall into it, and if you're if you're inflexible about it, you end up you missing an opportunity to do something that would be epic. Um. Uh, you also want to think about like the the type of story that you're wanting to tell if it's based on a certain style like Greek tragedy or like Arthurian legend or like and any any number of any number of things you want to think about your where you want to start where you want to end and what that climactic event yep. is that leads to that end I was going to say that the uh so uh uh, Jim Michael Straczynski, when he made Babylon 5, had a beginning point and an end point. And a vague idea of how he got there, but he didn't fill in the details. He did the details as he went. So that, in the vagaries of making a TV show, you know, he, he could pivot a little bit if he needed to. He had outs for every character, and you should. If you've got players in there and they're key, he, players might last forever. They may have an idea, maybe not a full full idea, but just like a concept of an out for them if they need to go away for a while or if they need to go away forever. 
You know, that may happen. And why ruin a good campaign because a player leaves? If you have just an idea for an out, something they've given you in their backstory, you know, uh, you know, the, the, the cool knight is apparently actually the prince and needs to go off and, you know, defend his homeland from something, you know, you can pivot like that. Have those little bits in there. Just don't put a lot of thought into it. A little bit of thought into it will help keep the, save the campaign. And that's, you, you need the campaign to last a while for it to be epic. Yeah. And also think about when you want to do lore drops. Mm-hmm. And how? Like, yeah. You can um, do them during the session, but in today's electronic society, if you don't have to do them in the session, you can do them between session. That gives people, you know, the time between games to like really digest them. And then if they don't digest them, you can make fun of them for not reading. Or maybe their character just doesn't care about stuff and wouldn't pay attention. Hashtag chaos gremlins. <laughs> Getting you never know. Sword. Good evening. Hey, Shadow Sword. Are two lore drops like Dark Souls items? <laughs> I had something I was going to say and now I've completely forgotten. I'm sorry. That's okay. You know I turned I and read something and then my brain just went boop. Uh, yeah. Uh, if I if I think of it here in a second, I will. <laughs> but yeah, so... But okay, After so what what could, makes them epic? Because you could have just a long story, but what's going to make it epic? Is it going to be just, oh, is this going to be a world ending something that yeah. happens, or not necessarily? You can have the most standard dungeon crawl be epic. It's what happens in it, and it's a lot of making sure the parts are as interconnected as they can be without being asinine, and and uh, making. I feel like the biggest way. Uh, is to make the players feel like what they've done has effect on the world. That makes it feel epic in a lot of cases. So that they've actually contributed and changed the world in some way, form, or fashion. Yeah. Now, Arnold Michael Lloyd has it correct. Epic is when they walk away with a great story. Absolutely. Yeah. But you've got to help them get there. Some some small campaigns will, will you'll end with a great story, but you want to help them get there. And I, and I personally feel... Whenever I feel like I my characters change the world for my purposes, you know, good or evil, may it be usually good. I'm that kind of guy. Um, I feel that that feels epic to me. Yeah. You know, or uh, when you good. Oh, uh, I was gonna say. Uh, I was also thinking. Uh, I think milestone leveling tailors itself well to epic level campaigns because that way your care your player characters aren't leveling up on experience before you get to the story points that you want to yeah yes and then say, yeah, if, and if then you're you playing a level based game yeah yeah but remember there's not just level based games out there if you're playing a non level based game mm -hmm. you can fudge whatever rules there are for for characters getting better and make sure they get better at certain points yeah you know if it's an experience point that you spend game hold a chunk of them behind Give them that one or two basic points or whatever, and then hold a chunk of it behind. Keep track of whatever you should be given and give it to them as a chunk so it feels like, oh, you just defe defeated, you know, this current big bad. You finished the level. Here's your chunk of experience points. Go get better. Because it kind of fits more with that feeling, you know. The standard dungeon crawl, gaining experience, leveling up on a whim doesn't feel epic. Now, I can still end up being that way, but that part... I don't want to say it's attracting. It's kind of neutral. You're not adding something. Leveling up when you do something impressive feels epic and will help that feel. Let's go farming level one cows for XP. Cows are worth no XP. They're no threat to you. Something is not threatening. It is not worth XPs. Trust me. I know about Eeps. We've, I've heard all about the stupid stuff people would do for Eeps back in the day. Uh, let's see. But I think, honestly, if you're going to, and it's weird, if you're going to shoot for an epic campaign, and I don't generally shoot for, I should shoot for a campaign and hopefully it'll be epic. Uh, but if you're shooting for it, you need to make sure your story feels epic. Like, yes, you could have a dungeon crawl in the back epic, but it, there should be something going on there. Why, and, why are you crawling through this dungeon? Yeah, but and you want some interconnectivity of things, you know? Yeah. You want to feel like you're doing something you know like 
oh, you know, we need to get to the bottom of this dungeon because we hear that a group of people in there had lost this magic item that this, the kingdom needs for X, Y, and Z. And honestly, some th- sometimes you can run it like like TV shows and longstanding media, comic books, or whatever goes, and you can have some fucking episodic stuff in there, and then suddenly you hit the continuity and shit gets real. Yeah, you, you get the, hey, we're just going to get together, run a dungeon, and oh shit, we found something in the dungeon that, you know, turns it into an epic. Or you come back to the village where you're based out of, and suddenly shit's going sideways, and, and you need to do things. And, and that's better than, you, you, can, you can skip that and start at the epic part, but sometimes those first couple levels, gaining them together and a natural progression of the character rather than starting at level three or whatever, um, feels better. You get those stories, you know? You get those weird things where people know your character. We ran one where I was consistently at one hit point at first level just because that's the way you should happen. And I still did absolutely asinine things like charging a row of, of crossbowmen and diving into them and shit to, to knock them all down. You know, that 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 starts it. And that, that becomes epic moments as part of it. it. It's hard to be just one moment being epic. It ends up being a building of all the things. A character becomes epic in a lot of cases. You know, you all remember that one player who had the epic character because they did all this crazy shit. Shit just went their way. But it's just super cool. You know, I, we talk about, you know, being epic, and I guess we could say the BBG doesn't always have to be at the very beginning of the story. They could find out that they're going against the BBG. Oh, no, the BBG. never have to. Yeah. Who's, well, I mean, so uh, there was something that Star Wars. Up about. Who's the big bad evil guy? It's Darth Vader, right? Grim nope. Tarkin. I mean, in the first movie, it is. Yep. Second movie, it's mostly Vader. Then you go like, oh, my God, there's someone above Vader. There's this emperor motherfucker. Yeah. Oh shit. You can build it like that. Build. There's I, a lot of. I like building like that. That that it adds more mystery. It adds more panache. I would say to everything. Yeah, panache. Good word. I like it. Because it, it just things are bigger than you think they are. Yep. And and there's big and I know this is arbitrary and some people on the internet don't like it. Fuck all them. They should only be as big as you can handle. Like if you're introducing the 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 rumor of a big bad evil guy, you should not have that big bad evil guy be fucking Doctor Doom when they're fucking playing the new mutants and shit. That's not going to end well. <laughs> and it's your fault. Like, well, they should have run away. You fucking introduced him as the bad guy of the campaign. You don't run away from the bad guy of the campaign. What are we wusses? We're heroes. We go fight them. Though I'd love it to be sometime you have the heroes go fight the bad guy early and they die and then everyone makes new characters as and you intended it that way, so now the stakes are fucking real. <laughs> but that's dangerous. I wrote my campaign, both parties are approaching a cataclysmic world changing event. And they know that. Which is a good way. That, I mean, that would feel epic. Yeah. Hey, if we don't get this done, the world's doomed. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Think about, uh, I'm going to say Final Fantasy VII, or the original, I'll say. I don't know about the remake. Yeah. Like, I know, technically speaking, when you get to the end of the game and, you know, it's the, the meteor's going to crash into Earth and everything's going to die, the planet, everything's going to die, you technically have forever. Until you get to the point, nothing's going to change. But it never felt that way for me. Like, as you move around the world, it's fucking there in the sky. I'm like, I need to go fucking stop that thing. So I went to the end game super quick and because it felt that way. It felt epic because it felt like the world was in danger. It, you know, it drew me in. And that's that's what you want to do. You need to have it be, draw your characters in so they feel like they want to go and take care of this. Yeah. They don't want to do side quests. <laughs> they don't want to do side quests. No, 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 it's fine and all. Like, I don't want to do side quests. There's a fucking bad guy over there I need to murder. Um, also, if you're going to do epic stuff, familiarize yourself with sort of like... How should I say it? Like, the, the lore and, like, the, the... 
technical arts of making a story. There's a bunch yeah. of books on role playing games. I have a bunch of them. They are all great reads. They're not all what you necessarily need. They all have different focuses, but they help you go through and maybe borrow stuff from other games or other media. Like there's a whole book from the guys from Feng Shui, Robin Laws from Feng Shui did that is basically a bunch of movies and how you can make them into role-playing adventures. Read that stuff, get an idea for that stuff, just find stuff somewhere online. It'll help you make those stories and get those beats you want. Yeah. You know, cliches exist for a reason and then you need to subvert them once in a while. You know, but the main cliches exist for a reason. So you want to make sure you're using them. You know, you need to use Chekhov's gun. You need to use all the proper, you know, setup for a bad guy. You need to use the idea of you're never going to fight the bad guy straight off. You're going to fight the dragon first, his lieutenant. And then you're going to fight the bad guy. These things, they're, they're cliche as fuck sometimes. But they're there for a reason also. And from a role-playing perspective, it's so... As a GM, we can make sure you're ready for the bad guy. Yeah. If the, if the dragon, so to speak, almost kills your party, we might want to rethink what we're doing for the bad guy. You ain't ready for the BBG. Yeah. And I would say also, if you're do, trying to do an epic campaign, you need to make sure... If someone dies, it's not just because of bad fucking luck. Unless it was yeah. absolutely epic bad luck. It can't just be, oh, I rolled good, you rolled bad, you know, I killed a party member. That That's not going to work. And I know people on the internet right now are raging and they can fuck off. It's okay to fudge dice rolls to keep your players alive if it serves the story purpose. Yeah. You are giving them a better story by taking it easy on them. And I know these some of these guys can't understand that. And it's, you know, whatever. They, they're they the ones missing out. I'm sad for them. <laughs> um, you, you need to make sure, especially if someone's got a story started that's going to be fucking epic. You cannot, I mean, I hate to say it, you got to protect that character. Uh, if you want to look at times it's good to kill a character, look at the, how uh, was it, the... Uh, Three gnomes and a half giant. My last game I recorded. Mm. Um, Brad's gnome died part of the way through because it was, I don't want to say epically bad luck, but he fucked around. So he found. And out. If someone fucks around, it's okay for them to find out. But then you know he gets a new character and he's got a new thing, and you build that in, and then Dave dies at the end of the campaign. It's fine because he knew what he was fucking doing. But until then, you don't want to. You want to make sure. You keep it to a minimum. There are times you'll know it's time, but don't be afraid. Like, don't let them get away with bullshit. But if it's just bad luck, fucking fudge that shit. Or ask your players if they would like to have their character die for story reasons. Yes, I have actually done that. I had a player that was leaving, so I wrote, her, I literally wrote her death to be like the end of uh, Pitch Black. Okay. Just... I, I've, I've asked characters are like, hey, would you want to do this? Because this yeah, would be we... really, really cool and would advance the story. And they're like, well, I kind of like this character. I was like, well, that's okay. You don't have to. I just wanted yeah. to ask. Mm -hmm. And they're like, well, wait a minute. Can we do X, Y, Z and make it really, really cool? I'm like, yeah, we can make something cool with it. <laughs> Fuck yeah, dude. Because even, it makes the story even better whenever that happens. Yeah. And oh, that, yeah. That's... Yeah, and I've done it before. I've asked people before. Um, also, like, listen to when your characters are talking. If they're tired of the character, you can try and get them aside and work out a death scene. Or, like in the case of Sewer Bear, when Sewer Bear bit the demon's head off, she's like, am I possessed by the demon now? And I'm like, Sewer Bear? I hadn't even thought of that, but fuck yes, you are. You got the, oh, the adventure of Sewer Bear. Oh, my God, that was fucking great. That's, that's an example of one that became epic just because that we played it for a while and just crazy shit happened. And the only thing I regret about the Avengers of Super Bear is that we didn't think about recording it until after the first session. And the first session was pretty fucking epic at points. 
Oh yeah, so I mean, there's, there's another view right there. You you can make things epic by having it just last a long time. By that point, you need to make sure things are connected. You yeah. know, like fuck's sake, uh, in one game, that game, one game, the PCs went to space to stop an alien invasion. They they visited a former, they a bad guy they'd fought because they thought he had a space shuttle and he had a space shuttle. Like, let's fucking go. I mean, crazy shit like that can be epic. It, yeah. And it's, those are the ones you need to, when you see that moment come, you need to seize it. Oh, yeah. Yes. Go. Just go. Use Even if you're your, running. Go ahead. Use your player's ideas. Use their jokes. Yes. I had, I had, my, I had one party getting ready to infiltrate the Thieves Guild, and one of them made a joke about it being a rave, so I made it a rave. <laughs> And sometimes I don't even realize you're listening and you do this stuff like, oh, God, I was right. I'm so psychic. This is amazing. But, yeah, steal their ideas when they're playing. like, and I'd say the biggest thing is make sure, you know, I mentioned earlier about having cliches, checkoffs, gun and all, but make sure you subvert some cliches so they're not just seeing them all coming. Yeah. Like when the plan, they make this plan that's super convoluted and everything, but it would work perfectly. Sometimes let the plan work perfectly. You know, oh, you guys didn't fuck up any dad's rule. You're playing perfectly. Sometimes they'll be like, holy shit, we, we made a plan and went through. That will be a memory. It doesn't have to go through good all the way. There could be shit afterwards. But let part of the, let the like, like we planned all this. You didn't plan your escape. Oh, fuck. Yeah. Just like with, just like with improv, the use the yes and. Yes and. That's the best. Yes and is a great step to turn things from just good to fucking epic. Like we talked about earlier in the, in the preamble is, uh, you know, hey, can I take a flaw for an extra feat? Yes. That's a yes yeah. and. I'd like an extra feat. Yes and. There was a discussion on Twitter. A guy's like, uh, hey, it would be cool if I had this sword from my master, you know, that uh, was, you know, magic weapon and all that he gave me. It'd be cool because I'm like a sword guy. And the DM's like, no. I'm like, well, how about it doesn't do anything initially, but it gets better as I get better. And they're like, no. And I'm like, what are you doing? Like, they're framing, like, this player was completely unreasonable. I'm like, no, no. I know who's unreasonable. It's you. Because you could have turned that into a good, you know, subplot. And Fucking you could design. Who's to say that sword ain't also cursed? Yeah. And you, you could Fuck, actually. Fuck, why do the bad guys always know where I am? Hmm. You know, you could have where that sword, you know, grows and grows by the deeds they do. And it can be changed by the deeds they do. Think about, um. Think about old school uh, intelligent weapons. Those are the little things that start to really get in there, like that crazy shit from like first edition D and D intelligent weapons and all that shit that people never used because never got that far. Look at that high level shit and see. Well, sometimes you can weasel it into lower levels, but sometimes you go like, "We need to get to the point where this is what we're doing because this is going to make things feel amazing." Give that player that epic weapon they wanted, but give it to them with a price. I guarantee you. Anyone who's ever played a paladin and got a fucking holy avenger remembers that fucking game. Because I've played me a bunch of paladins, I ain't even sniffed a holy avenger. I'm gonna be playing my first paladin coming up, so we'll see how that goes. <laughs> what god? Or conquest, pal or conquest okay. paladin. Okay, okay, you're, you're you're a badass paladin. I did I did con god um, of justice, justice, love... not law. Oh no, I'm a conquest paladin to a love goddess. Okay, that's... I'm the horny paladin. Awesome. I'm the horny satyr paladin. Oh, oh, you thought you were good, bard? Step in line, motherfucker! <laughs> yeah, and it's uh, uh, Wild Beyond the Witchlight, so... Yeah. Um, oh, lives by better. the rule of three, so uses that an excuse to yeah. um, never have less than two partners. <laughs> but remember <laughs> the stuff like that, like, like having a cool character like that. Someone comes up... um. When we did when we did three numbs and a half giant, uh, Jason before he left was like, "Hey, I want to play a necromancer, and here's my theme." And I'm like, "Fuck yes, you can. Roll that shit in there." And those little things will all build to make a game more epic. Every little thing you do, because it, it's it's a snowball rolling down a hill. One person asks for this cool thing, you say yes, and the next person's like. Well, I've always wanted to do this cool thing. Can I do this cool thing? Well, hell yes, you can do this cool thing. And now it's starting to go. Now 
people are starting to think outside the box. And you have to do it with um, actions in combat, too. I know it sounds weird, mm. but you have to make sure you're letting them do crazy things for an advantage. You know? Yeah. Give them inspiration. In combat, I move. Give yes. your players inspiration for good creative role play. Or whatever bonus or you get for the game. Puns. Yes. Yes. It's a, if, if that's a rule, that's a rule. Yeah. Do it. You know? But make sure they're doing that, because otherwise you get the, I move forward and I attack. Oh. Uh. <laughs> Your guns are blocked. Some games write it in. Feng Shui writes it in. If you just say, I hit him, eventually you start taking penalties, because what the fuck are you doing? This is an action movie. Tell me how you hit him. And that's one of the problems that I have with one of my parties, is that they are more the, I hit it. It doesn't have to be like, you know... You don't have to leap off the walls and do, you know, parkour. No. You could say, I, you know, it's just something simple. Well, look simple as I uh, step forward five feet and swing my sword at him. Boring. Yeah. How about I slowly slide forward my sword in a guard position and then looking for an opening, I thrust it in. You know, something like that. Or basically yeah. it says, like, he's got an axe. I come in under his axe and try and, you know, skewer him in the armpit. Just, just little shit like that makes all the difference. And I know that some people some people struggle with that, yeah. but if you don't try, you're never going to get good at it. And and again, doing stuff like that, the players don't realize he's hurting himself from thinking of this game as epic. Everyone else might come out of your game thinking, oh, that was epic. He's like, oh, it was fine. But it's because he's not bought in or, I mean, I understand not everyone's that creative. But sometimes I start to, this, I start to describe this shit for him, you know? Trying to, to draw it out of them. Yeah. Because all that stuff's going to make it different. Because once they start realizing, oh, hey, I can do this crazy thing. And sure, I'll make a roll for it. But if I succeed, John's going to give me a bonus? You do not know what players will do for a bonus to hit. Yeah. Even as oh, my God. One. You give me a plus one? Yeah. I oh, mean, yeah. Sometimes and you don't have necessarily have to give inspiration either for like good role play. You can give them a bonus to like, yeah. like I had a player, uh, uh, a few things. There's a few, a couple of things with this particular player. Uh, he w he started out as a skeleton arcana cleric named Ike Hill people. So Ike Hill people. Yeah. Yeah. I got it. Uh, couldn't heal himself. They had to shoot him back to health with a antimatter rifle. Um, <laughs> I thought for sure you could say bolts of healing. Nope, 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 nope. Uh, but he would draw angry eyebrows on himself, and, and so I would give him intimidation for like eight hours. Absolutely. Just all those little things, you know? Um, and, and some of this comes... And I'm going to say this, this is going to sound maybe a little harsh. Don't try and make a game that you're not, that you don't have system mastery of, epic. It will be very difficult. Now, granted, sometimes it'll come and it'll it'll get there anyways, but don't shoot for it if you don't have system mastery. You really need to know the ins and outs of the system, what bonuses you can and can't give to people to make it epic. Otherwise, shit's just going to get crazy real quick. Yeah. You know? And that's, that's a big thing. If you know the ins and outs of the game, if you know how the math works, and I know that sounds terrible, but you have to know how the math works. Just for the basics. You can go, okay, I can give this guy a plus one to hit and it's not game-breaking. Or I can give this guy a plus two to hit and it's not game-breaking. Maybe a plus three is game-breaking. You know how that math's going to work. You know the point where it's going to tip it enough that they feel like this is worth it. Because you need to make the crazy stuff worth it but not too worth it. Um, but yeah, system mastery in general is good because you want to know, like you said, milestone or uh, giving your XP in a bunch, what items to give, how to give them, items not to give. Yeah. Deck of many things. Um, um, no, no, it, that deck of many things is fine, but you've got, they have to understand that's a big deal. And you can work it in and make, if you ever really wanted to use deck of many things, you can make that part of it. Like, oh my god, you have to get this card to be able to defeat him because that holds the answer. Yeah, so, that's, that's always one that people like get into and they're like, oh shit, we fucked up. 
Yeah. One of one of the I'm in a very very short uh campaign that I played in uh I was playing what's called a Fate Weaver Warlock. It's a homebrew class where I used a combination of the deck of many fates and deck of many things to cast my spell. So at any point that I cast a spell, I could have voided myself. I, I mean from limited so, power, sometimes you need to take them chances. Yeah. Yeah. But and, and that's the thing. Homebrew classes, again, just take a quick look. Yeah. I mean, as long as your player understands, you might have to fucking, you know, nerf him or buff him, all of them on the fly. That's fine. All, all these things can be handled with discussion, and all those little things will go towards making things more epic, because once you open that door, more people do stuff, and the more outside the box you get, the more likely you're going to make a memorable and epic campaign. And I feel like that's why my players remember a lot of my campaigns because I I just I don't balance is fucking war games. This isn't a war game. This is a role playing game. I don't care about balance. If everyone's having fun, fun, we have fucking won. Yeah. Like I'd throw the flag, motherfuckers. Mission accomplished. We won. What I like is whenever someone you know they're they they've gotten into the game and they're doing stuff, and when a death happens and it's a reasonable death, not you know space cow or whatever, mm-hmm. it means a lot more to them. They're like. Shit, I'm more invested in this game now because I'm going to get that fucker. When an NPC dies and they fucking feel it, then you know you're on the way. Yeah. Yeah. And and part of it is to make, you don't need to go all in on your NPCs, but you need to make the ones who are going to recur memorable. Little things. You know, we we had one for the, uh, one of the superhero games, I think it was probably, it could have been Superhero, it could have been something like that, where... You know, uh, the the guy working for the the international, uh, you know, for until the international uh, organization, he had a whole support team and all. And one of them was the nerd, he called him. And you just do those nerdy things and you you build a character. Sure, it's fucking cliche as hell. But when he hands him, he's like, "Uh, here's this weird metal we need to test. And he's like. Eh, licks it and he's like uh, it's this 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 and this and you're like what the hell is going on they all remember that shit yeah um one last thing i want to touch on before i forget um yes. something when you're starting an epic campaign or any campaign for that matter um you can find or you can find copies of this resource or examples of it uh online but there's what's called an rpg consent form where you can talk to your players and talk about what are they okay with existing in the campaign? What are yes. they not okay? What yes. is what is an ab- what is going to make them nope out of a game? Like Option zero. Yeah, yeah. But this is even pre that you you can put out there so they know. Like, hey, maybe they have a big problem, and I'm going to put some of the extreme examples on there. Police, maybe they're not okay with police being a big thing because they have a problem. Yeah. In today's society, understandable. That you'll know. Just so you know, this is another one that's going to make the internet go nuts because it's the same guys who fucking hate uh, fudging rolls and stuff. Oh yeah. Yeah, and but it's important. This is a group game. We are all in this together. Yeah. That like, is why we fudge rolls. This is why we consent. This is why something is getting uncomfortable. You throttle back. Yeah, like I unintentionally threw a player with an arachnid with arachnophobia in a room with a giant spider and made them fight it without realizing that they didn't say something until after game. And I was like, I'm so sorry. I wish I'd known that beforehand. So, and that's why you do those things. You do not want to make your players uncomfortable. Yep. And if they or mention yourself. It, and if they mention it, you can, you can fucking easily zip out of that and go like, uh, it's not a giant spider. It's something you're not upset about. I mean, like just, it's a, you giant, don't have to change it's a giant spider on roller skates. Meh. <laughs> or, or it, it, it's a giant rat with eight legs. It's giant a rat. rat. Just, just, you can just literally cross out giant spider and change it to a rat, and just the mental change in them will make all the difference. You don't change the stats at all. It yeah. just spits webs at you. Why does it spit webs? Fuck you, it's a mutant rat. No rules it's for this moth. shit. It's a moth. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, keep that stuff in mind because you want to know. You don't. You, we're not here to cause anxiety to anyone. That is not why we're here. So. Yeah. But yeah, this is a talk that can go on a lot. There's a lot of role playing ideas we can have. If you guys have 
a subtopic or a related topic you want, throw it to us on Facebook. We're happy to yeah. cover it. Nerd eats this stuff up. I do too, obviously. We all do. We all, all of us, each one of us are a GM in varying ways. And it's, it's, it's something that we're passionate about because we like creating cool stories. And we like seeing people get, you know, like invested and happy and energetic and so on and so forth uh about yep. our games and it's mm-hmm. it, it's something that we you know not only as you know players and gms it's hey we're here for a limited amount of time let's try to have as much fun as possible yeah uh, like a limited amount of time we ain't got time to play games we ain't enjoying make the game enjoyable yeah. Oh, yeah yeah have a blast while you're doing it um, like people people talk about uh, just to finish up real quick. People talk about the how kids don't worry about if their character dies. Well, yeah, they get nothing but fucking free time. They don't care. <laughs> they don't. They're not emotionally messed, invested. They don't have the empathy. They don't have all these things you develop as an adult. And that's okay. Nothing wrong yeah. with that. But as an adult, we have limited time, much more empathy. And we get much more invested in our fucking hobbies because this is what fucking keeps us going. Yeah. Um, it's the the nine to five that keeps us going. Before we get into the movies, is the ending of the game. Once Ooh. you've ended the game. No, no. Guys, I think we should handle that next time. Oh, okay. Let's make it a cliffhanger. End of the game. How do you handle that then? We'll work on that one. Because that's, that's I actually, actually have very somebody important. I can talk to. They just ended their campaign. So I'm like, the, I, I know somebody that'd be good to talk to about that. Yeah. yeah. Also, then, cliffhanger is one of the options for ending games. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I always love a cliffhanger. Everybody knows that when I run a game, I always leave our session on a cliffhanger. That way it gets everybody invested and energetic for the next one. All right. So let's, I'm going to, before we start on media, cause we got a bit to that too. I want to, uh, go through the, the chat that we didn't, we missed, uh, Art Michael Boy, I had players request. They have a chance to be criminals with one of the current games. That's Ooh. cool. Let them do it. Yeah. Uh, Xander Vorlord, some act, uh, that the player did through their life, did some insane stuff with one weapon and then they imprinted that. Awesome. It's a great idea for letting yeah. someone have a cool weapon. Art of Michael Boy, I'm experiencing something with like destiny points where they can change small stuff in the environment. Yes, I have luck points that we use that are just poker to a different color. We throw in a bag and pull them out for a lot of games. And from from low to medium effect, low to high effect, they can change little bits to high bits of the game up to the gold shit where they can actually almost be GM for a bit. Uh, Cookie says, we used to play Palladium Heroes and Villains. That's uh, Heroes Unlimited for those of you at home. Uh, my bud wanted to do John Woo stuff. I was like, hell yeah, roll bud. Yeah, absolutely. Say yes. And assign difficulty. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and Xander Bord says D&D can also be a teaching tool for learning empathy. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. Uh, and yes, Captain Mizzy Gonzo likes to end the cliffhangers. So he likes to deal emotional damage. <laughs> yes. <laughs> cliffhangers emotional are emotional damage. damage. <laughs> I also like inflicting emotional damage on my players. I'm just not good at cliffhangers. Yeah, it's tough. But I felt like we were going to go on too long and kill the movie section. And people are excited to hear certain parts of the movie section. I will let you guys start with Rubble Moon. No, we'll, we'll do that at the end. Just, okay. Yeah. So I'll go with one. So um, this is not a movie, and it hasn't come out yet, but something I'm very excited for is The Dead Boy Detectives. Uh, it's coming out on Netflix uh, next week. It is a Neil Gaiman um, series uh, about people that are these dead boys that are detectives. And it has to do with all spook, goblins, and goose. It is the 25th. Um, I love Neil Gaiman to begin with. Um, And if if they gave it the same amount of respect that they gave Sandman, this will be fucking amazing. Nerd, watch the trailer after this. Two yeah. teenage ghosts work alongside a clairvoyant to solve mysteries for their supernatural clientele until a powerful witch complicates their plan. Okay. <laughs> it looks that's, a lot. It looks true. like a lot of fun. Um, I just wanted to bring it out before we get started because that was one of the things. I was like, this looks like it's going to be great, and I guess I'm a Neil Gaiman fan, so even better. Well, Matt Wagner did the art of the comic. Matt Wagner's a legend. Um, so something I watched this week because it was it was suggested to me um, was Resident Alien. Now, uh, it, I started watching, and I had it more as a background thing because I was reading my book and so on and so forth, and I was enjoying it. Uh, the characters are fun. There's technically three seasons out there. The third season is on Paramount, 
We only have two on Netflix. So, Captain Mizzy, if you want to watch the third one, you got to watch it on Paramount. And it is completed. We don't know if we're getting a fourth season or not. Um, gotcha. I'm only through season one. And Alan Dirt, I mean, he's just, he has got good physical comedy with his face, his mannerism, you know, everything. Like, we're trying to eat stuff. And then you're like, when he tries to spit it out, it's just, a, you know, you can tell that it's like, not the way a human would do it, <laughs> type thing. Yeah. It, oh, it, he's so good at weird. Yeah. It's really, he's really so good, at, good weird. at weird. It was a lot of fun. I'm having a good time with it. It's it's very relaxing, very easy. You know, thirty minute episodes. There's a lot of subplots in this though, uh, and a lot of other characters that revolve around the whole story, which is good because then you. I get also love the kid. Yeah, the, the kid, kid was pretty good. Is. Um, and, and yeah, his line. This is some bullshit. <laughs> it's great. <laughs> um, and him using, you know, earth language to describe stuff and everything. It's just really good. It's I, Season one, Zero Space Herpes, just because it was a good, solid series. Um, you care about the characters. You learn about the characters, about other things. And you, you, you try to root for the good guys, but the good guys feel like the bad guys. And, you know, you don't know who to root for in this but definitely uh, a worthwhile watch um, especially for a 30 minute show like I said it's on Netflix so you can go from there um, it started off as a sci-fi show right yeah I think it did start yeah. off on sci-fi uh, and I think it's still on sci-fi but it's pushed over to Paramount also sci-fi gotcha. still exists yeah it does oh and uh, nerd you have a copy of the dead boy detectives on uh, messenger when you want to watch it uh, I highly suggest it. It would look like it's going to be a lot of fun. Fingers crossed. Um, oh. So, John, what's your non-Rebel Moon one? I got a couple, um, okay. but I'll start with the movie I watched, which is an old movie called Ronin, oh, yeah. um, starring um, my brain stop. It's actually got a really good... It's got Sean Bean. He lives through it. Crazy. First that is. time ever? <laughs> what? Yeah, I know, right? I don't think I've ever seen him live through a movie. He does. He, he he plays his character well, and he's like a, uh, you know, trying to be a tough guy, ex, pretending he's ex-military. He's like, oh, I'm SAS. I'm like, yeah, of course you are, dude. Um, but yeah, Robert De Niro, obviously, is the lead. Uh, Gene Reno, um, Stellan Skarsgård's in it, Jonathan Price. It's got a pretty good cast. It's a very tight movie. It is ostensibly an action movie but it's much more action movie like the first mission impossible is an action movie there's a bit more gunplay in it but it's not the the main theme of the movie the it's spy heist movie it's super fun the best thing about it though it is has what is pretty much categorically the second best car chase in movie history in it the best being Bullet with Steve McQueen, but that's because they filmed that shit fucking, uh, you know, guerrilla style with no permits or shit with real cars yeah. and all. <laughs> that's and they did this, like, they, it's, there's a couple good car chases in it, but, like, the, the main one is great. Um, Stellan Skarsgård's great in it. Um, De Niro's good. He plays a good tough guy. Uh, Gene Reno's great in it. Why did he not get more movies? It must be because he's French. I don't know, but he's great in this. I mean, obviously, he's had his big movies, but just solid fun. It's one of those ones where I actually say the title of the movie in the period. You know, there's a period where they're with a guy, and his hobby is painting miniatures. He's setting up this big display, but it's feudal Japan. And he talks about the Master of Samurai. Because the idea is, you know, like, oh, hey, these guys all used to be with some of the, one of those big three-letter agencies, and now they're all freelancers doing the job. So they're kind of like Ronin. But it's a good watch. Like I said, the gunplay's not the best. It's fine. It's serviceable. But the real thing is the dialogue's good. De Niro and Gene Reno have great chemistry. Actually, De Niro's got great chemistry with the whole cast. Almost like he's a fucking great star. And uh, those... those couple car chases are absolutely amazing uh you can't stream it anywhere right now i bought it on blu-ray because i'm john and that's what i fucking do <laughs> and i half mostly because of its age and because the gunplay could be better um 
you know, I don't want to give a 19, I mean, it's 1998 film, so really at that point, you probably could have done much better gunplay. It's after the fucking Hong Kong invasion and heroic bloodshed, but I'm not going to hold too much against it. You know, half a space rupee, it's great. You should watch it. Nerd? Uh, I went to see Godzilla X Kong, which lived up to my friend's description of they didn't, or uh, disclaimer that they didn't ruin all the good scenes with the trailer. Oh, good. Good. So, (laughs) and for whatever reason, when I went to the theater, the the concession person was like, now there aren't any post-credit scenes. And I'm like, I didn't think there was. I mean, honestly, I appreciate that. Even at this point in my life, if we get in a movie and I have to pee, I just go pee. I don't care. They're like, there's eight minutes of credits. Don't sit through it. I'm like, okay. (laughs) (laughs) That's a concession person who is good at their job. Uh, Cause isn't that what you want to know in a movie? Like, oh, there's a post credits and there's a mid credit stinger. There's a post credits. Like, oh shit, I'm gonna have to hold it for an extra couple minutes. So it's like, like all the Godzilla movies and King Kong movies have been so far heavy on the CGI. Um, mm-hmm. But what they couldn't they couldn't find a real you know forty story real lizard? giant gorilla. <laughs> for for me for me the highlight of the movie is Dan Stevens' character. Um, he was, uh, David in Legion, the one about, uh, the, the Marvel show. Mm -hmm. Uh, but he, he, he plays, um, King Kong's, uh, vet. Okay. (laughs) And he, his name is Trapper and he ends up getting taken on... The thing is, he's just this hippy dippy veterinarian that happens to work on, on King Kong and he's the in my opinion, the best part of the movie. (laughs) (laughs) His character and quips and stuff like that. But like, it was fun. It is, it is by no means a masterpiece. It's a Godzilla movie. Um, It's an American Godzilla movie. Let me clarify. Uh, (laughs) But Uh, it was, uh, it was enjoyable. It was fun. I cheered. I laughed. Okay. I think my only ever complaint about these movies currently is that they don't bring all the characters back. Yeah. You know, you're like, you've got all these characters made. I mean, I'd like to see more continuity between them. But I mean, I understand. It's not always easy. Yeah. So I give it like one and a half because the story was kind of lacking. I know that they can do better, especially now given seeing Monarch. But it did good in the theater, which is a good sign for this kind of movie in general. And I love it. Yes. So, yeah. All right. Gonzo. Um, I watched the next episode of Discovery, and this was uh, a little bit more of a filler episode. Um, wasn't bad. Um, I was just kind of like, uh, I wish I could have had more about what the true story is about. Uh, so, still Discovery. I'm glad they're getting an ending to the series. Um, keep going with it. Still like all the characters. They brought back uh, some characters from the previous seasons, which was good because um, I missed some of them. Um, but it was, it was a character building episode, not, you know, not a advanced uh, main story episode, um, which is still good. I'm going to nitpick only because I got in this fucking fight on Twitter over the, of course, because it's John, (laughs) uh, it's not a fill. If they advance characters, it's not a filler. episode. Yeah. That's why I I changed it. They were more advancing character plot and not a filler episode, but Technically speaking, you could call it that. It just depends on your definition. Yeah, um, but they 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 expanded the characters' relationships and their you know personas and such, which was good. Mm-hmm. Um, but I'm like, I really want to know what happens. You know, I'm like, <laughs> let, let, let's get to the story. I want to know the story. I need I'm to know what eager. happens next. Yeah, I'm just eager what for that. Next? So uh, no, no, you know. Anything yet? So any ratings? Because I'm just enjoying. It. I'm I'm gonna miss the show when it's gone because it's a good Star Trek. And anytime a you know a good sci-fi show leaves, even if it's for good reasons, I'm still like ah crap. Okay. So, John, you got something else? I got plenty of things else. Um, uh, I watched the first two episodes of Fallout with uh, Not Brushhead Dave. Yep. Enjoyed them. I am a little disappointed that everyone's like, oh, look at this Walton Goggins. He's great. Like, motherfucker, did you not see Justify? Did you not see The Wire? 
He's always been great. He's also, like, you can give him a five-minute part in a fucking second G.I. Joe movie, and he's still enjoyable in that. You're like, oh, it's Walton Goggins. This is going to be amusing. Spoiler, he did get a five-minute part in the second G.I. Joe movie, and he was enjoyable. Uh, he's great. Um, I, honestly, I like I like everything I've seen so far. Um, I'm told the humor is very spot on for Fallout. Yep. Um, see, Dave's there, so he can tell me all the Fallout stuff because I've not played a Fallout game. Though, I may or may not have bought Fallout Four Game of the Year Edition and Fallout New Vegas Ultimate Edition, and paid less than I did for breakfast that morning. So, unfortunately, those deals are gone. But keep an eye out; they might have on Steam again. But I'm enjoying it. Looking forward to getting through it all. It's only about two episodes a week, Gonzo, so it's gonna be about another you know rest of the month before we get you know full month before we get through it all i you know you're watching it you're saying you're enjoying it then i'm good uh type thing it's they they really nailed the game and that's what that's what really was very important is they nailed the game well no what's really really important is they nailed it being enjoyable we won't know anything about the game correct that too i mean it, but like you, me yeah. yeah i mean i don't i mean i know some basic stuff but um, I know. Cool. I know that rad roaches are a thing. <laughs> rad roaches are apparent, but apparently, if you got a good dog, it'll be okay. How's Matt Barry in it? I've heard. I've heard he's he's great as the robot. The voice of the oh. robot. Oh, oh, still good. Oh. Same thing. I don't think I've seen him yet. Gotcha. I did love oh. that the the scientist that showed up in uh, the you know in the first two episodes was. Uh, Finch from uh, Person of Interest. Yeah, I love seeing actors. He's enjoyable in that. He's enjoyable in this. I liking it. So, looking for obviously, like Gonzo says, not giving a rating until it's done. But signs are good. Nerd, nerd. Uh, so I finished Fourth Wing, uh, by Rebecca <laughs> Yaros. Yeah, Gonzo, what you got? Gonzo's laughing like I should know what this is. Hold on. No, you don't know what this is. Go ahead. Keep going, nerd. It's about a military school of dragon riders. Okay. Yeah. Sounds uh, like a really I'll... cool concept. Just out with it, Gonzo. No, go ahead. I'm going to let you. It's your review. I feel like you're going to destroy my review. It's your review. Go for it. So, uh, main female character, daughter of the general, uh, gets forced in, uh, forced into joining the Dragon Riders, uh, spends most of the time barely surviving, but somehow surviving because there's always someone there to save her ass. Um, she, one thing I appreciate is the character does it like when she fucks up, she doesn't wallow in it. She actually like keeps fighting, but I'm, I know what Gonzo is going to say and I'm not going to say it. I'll let Gonzo little smirky smirk over there, uh, give his opinion. Uh, I give it like, one and a half stars because it's it, like I've seen better fantasy writing, but it's also like super Mary Sue fan fiction. Very much so. It is to, to give you a description. This woman wanted to write a dragon writer, Harry Potter book, but wanted the kids to have sex. So she made them adults. I don't actually see a problem with that. Okay. The problem is it's bad, bad writing. Um, go to book two. And give me, come back to me when you're putting opinion with book two. It'll be it'll be like a month before I have it on hold from the library. Yeah, that's fine. I'm not going to spoil book two. Um, I thought there was some really cool things in there. The problem is she contradicts herself a lot. And the spicy scenes, I fast forward to because that's not my thing. I don't care for it. Yeah. Uh, she the the idea of the the thing uh, of the story of. The, you know, Dragon Rider college, you know, to fight people. Cool concept. Harry yeah, Potter no, with it's... Dragon Riders. Cool concept. Um, yeah. And then you go read book two. And then I'm not going to spoil Go read book two and then come back to me with that, please. Um, Mizzy and I have both. And I didn't care for the spicy scenes, but I know it's not for me, so I went over it. Yeah. But I thought she had something 
but she contradicts herself a lot in this story. I have wondered why, like, I was confused at times. There was, she, she'll say, like, hey, this dragon's supposed to be purple. And you turn around and, like, 20 pages later, it's, it's polka orange. dotted. Yeah. There, there, she, she, her continuity of her world building is way off. Mm. But go read book two. When you get a chance, go read book two. Okay. I did not. Yeah. I, I like thought, I said, I've got it on hold. Yeah. It, it could have been something great, but I think she's suffering a lot of pressure from the whole concept of people want her to sell this book like crazy. Cause I guess TikTok or whatever, like highly promoted this book and the publishers are like, you need to do book two, three, four, five, and six now. And so like book two was rushed out so fast that all of her fans are, a lot of her fans are like, this is bad. So yeah. Go like, read book two. Um, hold on. Let me, let me pull up a couple of, uh, the other title of something, uh, that's been recommended to me. My friends have started recommending smut for me to read uh, and review for the podcast. So Ice Planet Barbarians is probably next. Okay. Uh, <laughs> John, <laughs> let, let's let's get our Rebel Moon out of the way. So Rebel Moon Part 2, Scar Giver. The uh, Scar Giver. Let's give it this proper title. The Scar Giver. Because that's giver. her name. Yes. Because she... You know what? They don't actually explain it until after he gives her second scar, apparently. Yeah, so that uh, I'm watching this, and in the first 20 minutes, there was already six slow-mo scenes, which means that could have been cut down Dude, to probably 10 minutes. you cannot harvest <laughs> grain without going slow-mo. Yeah. That shit went hard. I'm like, oh, man, they are harvesting the fuck, fuck out of that yeah. grain. And, and dipping the water bottle in the water. Oh my god! It was you needed that intense scene of him getting Fortunately, water. Fortunately, after that, it actually gets a lot better. Well, I, I'm sitting there watching it. It's like he calls her the Scar Giver at the beginning of it, and I'm like, okay. And then I'm like, well, that's a title. She left a scar on 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 Belarus or whatever the fuck that guy's name is. And then a little bit later, he Belisarius. goes, Belisarius. Donald P. Belisario. And then like 30 minutes later, he's like, you know, I'm sorry, sir, that we weren't able to get rid of all your scars, but it's okay. The Scar Giver gave, gave me this scar. And I'm like, <sighs> why was she the scar giver in the first place? Yeah. <laughs> they, she, the, the flat, they give the flashback scene of what happened, and she didn't even hit the main dude with that. I don't know why you'd give call her that. Yeah. It, also, man, that evil empire just keeps <laughs> yeah. more mustache twirling bullshit. Does not feel like a faction. Like they, they, oof. I think they're worse than stormtroopers. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I do like that. You know, I do like the one character who questioned it and stayed there and was helping. Cool. They didn't explain much beyond that. I feel like for a two-part movie that could have been one part. I feel like I'm missing a lot. There, it, it's still. I'm gonna tell you right. Why is, it's, it's not why good. Is, why is the robot wearing antlers? Yeah. Why is the robot dressed like, the way the other? It's cool. It's cool. I love the robot. He's great. Why is he wearing antlers? But for an entire faction of evil empire that has taken over the galaxy, they fight like crap. Yeah. I mean, I mean sticks and stones probably would have killed them so early on. The whole idea of the seven samurai slash seven story is that there are a lot more of the farmers who can't fucking fight well than there are the bandits. Correct. So they hire a handful of warriors to help them. Not like, oh, there's a handful of farmers and a handful of warriors and fucking a million fucking troops. Remember that ship tanks? holds like 5,000 troops and has tanks and... Airplanes? Now, some of it is handled well. Some of it is... Like I'm going to say, Gonzo's going to tell you it's terrible. He doesn't watch enough shitty sci-fi. It's mediocre. <laughs> I can tell you that I've seen plenty of sci-fi that is way worse than this. <laughs> yeah, but for what is supposed to be the replacement of Star Wars and re and become the greatest science fiction of all time? Uh, no, so he's not saying that. His fans are fucking idiots. Like, there are people who are just like, oh, I enjoyed it. Cool, dude. But there are people who are like, hey, it's the best movie ever. Like, it's uh, the fucking... Uh, it's uh, the GOAT. The energy sword fight is so much better than a lightsaber duel in fucking Star Wars. And I'm like, the fuck? Did you not watch Duel of Fates? 
I went his crappy sci-fi movie night with John. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but so, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's a lot better than the first one. It is. I will say it is better than the first the one. The sci-fi is you, the sci-fi, the slow-mo for sci-fi too, is used more sparingly and is more impactful by doing so, even though it is still excessive. Why, why do you do slow-mo of harvesting grain? Look, after that point, let's let, let, call pass on this harvesting grain. <laughs> uh, or dip in your, dip in your thing, cantina in the water. <laughs> Look, he's also the fucking best character in the fucking movie. Yeah. Like, I'm trying to pronounce his name correctly. I'm not going to be able to because I am terrible. Uh, what, okay, so they give them five days to get ready for this invasion. Yeah, when they're supposed to come back like months later. They give them five days to get ready, and they have to harvest all the grain, create espionage tunnels, you know, like a Viet Cong type oh, tunnels. I, I don't mind that. That happens in that happens in those in 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 Seven Samurai movies all the time. And his name is pronounced uh, Jaimin Onsun. He's great. He is the best character in that. Him and the pirate chick. Yeah. I don't know where the pirate chick that decides to stay with them after the fucking fight. She's great. She feels heartfelt. Those two are more compelling than every other motherfucker at that table when they're given their backstories. Maybe the guy who who lives in the farm and is the love interest, he's okay too. But uh, Cora and fucking I'm a space prince dude and I don't wear a shirt because I'm built. And, and... fucking Nemesis. They're fucking, they're just not interesting. No. They don't put enough into making him interesting. And I can say that because every other Magnificent Seven Seven Samurai movie has done a better job of making these same fucking characters interesting. Yeah, it was By bad. the end, they figured out who she's supposed to be. She followed the same story beats of the Robert Vaughn character. And actually funny he Robert Vaughn in two of those three movies because he's right he's the best there you know he's the the, the gunfighter who's great in fucking Magnus 7 and he's the same character in fucking Battle Beyond the Stars anyways um but yeah so it's um uh, I had some notes here um there's a scene when they infiltrate the ship and the medic scene great that was handled like I'm like this is attention to detail I feel like they're actually acting like people would in that case, the bad guys even. But like, given their utter distaste for apparently their own men, I was fucking shocked. Like it really it was it was good enough that it stood out to me. And then the big problem, and I mentioned Gonzo this, aside from the fact that I did literally have four shots of Kraken while watching the movie. It also was only two hours long, thank God. That's why um, you had all that. <laughs> yeah. I didn't um, know that's what that explains so much. <laughs> yes, yes, that's why I've been drinking since twelve thirty. Um, Zack Snyder has a problem with set off to set up to pay off. Yes, that's why I said it's related to our topic for the day. You need to do the proper setup to have the proper payoff. He has the payoff, but it is not impactful in most cases because he did not spend the time to do the proper setup. And no. that is the biggest failing of this movie in any way. Everything else is forgivable. I've seen worse and better movies. But if you can't do the proper setup to pay off, you know, you end up with Crap. this shit. But don't worry, we've got four more movies to come so we can mm. finish the trilogy. The shitology. The shitology. Because <laughs> I, I, that was announced this uh, this week or last week. That, I don't think it's going to, they're not going to let him do it. I, if Netflix does it, I would be so surprised. And it's not because it's not getting views. It's getting views. We're watching it in morbid curiosity, which gets it views. So they make the next one. The problem is, is it's bad press because it looks like net, like someone actually literally had a, a tweet on a thing on Twitter, like a thread of like, why do we let Netflix do this predatory shit to us? I'm like, Motherfucker, they want a PG-13 movie because that's what's fucking going to get people to watch. They ain't going to even watch an R movie that's like fucking six hours long. No. No one's going to do that. But a PG-13 is about two hours. People watch that shit on a whim. Yeah. 
And it's not predatory tax on Netflix. It's them doing what's good for them on a business standpoint. But what's not good for them is them looking bad because like, oh, look, they're handcuffing the great artiste Zack Snyder from his vision of Rebel Moon. And I'm like, oh, fuck yourself. Do you really think these movies are going to climb out of the fucking seller to mediocrity of sci-fi just because he made it rated R and an hour longer? Um, I will say, I've not seen the extended edition of Man of Steel. I don't have fucking give a shit. But based on the extended edition of both Justice League and fucking uh, Batman vs Superman, no, it's not. Granted, he's got a win. The director's edition of Watchmen is much better than the theatrical cut. But that's a different beast. I don't know how... How does someone go from making Watchmen, which is a great movie, to making this shit? I don't even fucking understand. Yeah. That's, that's I hope he's so okay. Weird. Someone check on Zack Snyder. Is he okay? Like, I know his daughter passed him in Justice League. That's fucking tragic. I feel for the man. I will forever give him a pass on Justice League in its entirety, even the extended edition, because of that. No one should have to fucking live through that. But this, I was excited to see what he could do because I've loved the visuals of his movies. I want to see him do his own property because he doesn't fucking understand Superman. He should say the fuck away. He doesn't understand Batman. He should say the fuck away. He even went so far as to say, like, he wants to make, you know, not standard superhero movies. Like, cool, don't do Superman and Batman. There's a million other superheroes you can deal with. But this is just not, not great. Yeah. Gonzo is going to give it like three and a half to four. Yep. That's what, which one it is. I'm going to give it 2.5. Dead center. I would say if you if you like sci-fi, you can watch this movie. You'll be okay. It's There's nothing offensive in it, really. It's not even as batshit crazy as the first one. And honestly, you barely need to watch the first one to understand what happened. Oh, yeah. You could read the Cliff's Notes. And honestly, you could almost just watch this without it. And you'd be like, oh, I understand. All the beats are here. <laughs> Cookie. <laughs> Cookie says uh, his buddy loved it. but loved it. We're no longer friends. <laughs> I, I can imagine enjoying it the same way I enjoy certain movies. Sometimes the things just hit you the right way. I can't imagine loving it. But it is 100% watchable. I've seen a ton of shittier movies. Two and a half. Pure average. Don't take the fact that I had four shots of crack in the middle of it. That's just because uh, fucking uh, John Cena the Marine. See, I see a problem with your friend, Cookie, because the Marine's not a great movie. You want to watch 12 blocks of John Cena? Much better movie. <laughs> Anyways. Will we watch the extended edition, Gonzo? Please say no. 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 I, I may, may listen to see you know, what, what was changed. It, it, if the reviews are like, oh my god, look how much better this is. I may check it out then. But I, didn't, I ain't got time like that. I regret yeah. watching Justice League extended. Yeah. But yeah. Oof. I, I don't think it's going to go anywhere. He's not going to get what he wants to do. Um, I, I I would be very I don't mind the setup for more. next movie, though. The setup for the next movie was fine. I'm like, oh, that actually fits with what it showed in the flashback scenes and everything. This is good. And you get the robot. The robot's in. The robot's in. I might be in. I'll be honest. If they do a third and fourth movies, I, I'd consider them. Not granted. Not going to like go out of my way. We might not opening weekend and weekend then, unless we just really want to realize. Like, I... I'll be honest, I was expecting this to be much more of a slog. It was downright a treat in comparison, but it's still a treat because I was drinking. It was much better than the first. I will definitely say yeah. that. When I when I got Absolutely. down, I was like, way better than the first one, but the first one was so shitty. I would say the worst one's not really watchable for the most part, and this one's watchable. Yeah. That's the biggest difference. I, I could rewatch this. I don't want to. But I could. I wouldn't be like, oh, God, shoot me instead. So, first of all, mm. it, something you put, around, put on in the background while you're doing chores so you don't have to pay attention to it. You just have noise. <laughs> yeah. I, I, yeah, I hate this. Else. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'd go for something else. Something where I actually want to see the scenes. There's not... It's even missing signature scenes. There's some cool, like, scenes, but they're not, like, cool enough that you want to go. It's not like, well, not like 300 where you're like, I want to fucking watch that scene again. Anyways. We should probably stop before we rant forever. Yeah, because we're actually four minutes over. Guys, we oh appreciate you being here. Cookie he hates me. We the nation <laughs> goal, make John sit through all of them back to back. Oh, that sounds like torture, actually. So, um, we will be sending you off to Monster Den Minis. 
Sure. Yay! We'll send you off to Monster Den Minis when we get out of here. But like always, people, please take care of yourself. Please look after each other. Um, we want to see you at the next uh, convention or the next uh, show or, you know, whatever. So we we'll uh, see you give them the thumbs up on Facebook, Twitter, yeah. whatever. We want to see. We want to see, you know, so and so like this post. We want to see that. Yeah. You know so, that you're there and OK. Please take care of yourself. If you see something, say something. If you hear something, say something. If you can do something, do something. Uh, if you can't, find someone that will, because we've got to look after each other. For more than dice, I'm Gonzo. I need to stop drinking. <laughs> I'm nerd. Good night. Thanks for listening to More Than Dice. Making the world a better, nerdier place, one dumb joke at a time. Be sure to subscribe wherever you heard this podcast so you never miss a future episode. For more nerdy action or to connect with your hosts, check them out on Facebook.com slash more than dice and twitch.tv slash more underscore then underscore dice. Until next time, stay nerdy, stay proud, and we'll see you soon on the More Than Dice podcast.